Hallelujah. C- can we praise him this morning? Can we give him some praise this morning? Oh, praise the Lord. That was okay. That was okay. <laughs> worship was good. Great job, worship team. Was, has God been good to you this week? Amen. Yeah, whether, whether you know it or not, whether you had a good week or not, whether this may have been the hardest week of your life, but can I tell you, God has been good to you this week. Yes. You know, we go through the hard times and then we look back like, I can't believe I made it through that. But, but, but we do. Think of all the things you've gone through in your life, but guess all the hardships, all the trials, all the struggles. Yeah, guess you look back, well, how'd I make, I'm still here. Yeah. I'm still here. I'm still breathing. God is, we haven't, we only breathe, but by the grace of God. Amen. God has been good. God deserves our praise. Amen. God is worthy of our praise. So I'm going to help you out a little bit. Let's, let's try this again. Would you stand with me, please? Just close your eyes. Everybody, close your eyes. We'll wait for Tom to stand. Come on, brother. And, and you know what? Can we, can, we, can we just raise our hands for one minute? Everybody's eyes are closed. Nobody's looking at you except Jesus. And, and you know what? Look, can you look? Can we look up? Can we look up, lift our heads with our eyes closed and our hands raised? And what, that's a weird posture, isn't it? Some of you have never experienced this posture of praise before. Hands raised, eyes closed, focused, our minds fixed on our Lord and Savior who has been so good to us with our heads lifted high as opposed to bowed down. In, but, but, but He cleansed us. He made us whole. He made, gave us, He said, come boldly before the throne of grace. We raise our heads and our hands boldly as we enter His presence. Can you repeat the word? Can you just repeat this word after me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, can you, re- can you say it to the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can you say that? Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. It's not that hard, is it? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. Clapping is good. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor today. Thank you, Jesus. Say it again. Thank you, Jesus. Do you love him today? Do you love him today? Can you just tell him, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you for your presence. Praise God. Glory to God. Trying to, I know what's in your hearts. I know what's in your hearts. God knows what's in your hearts, but, but sometimes we just need to verbalize it to him. He wants to hear us. Okay. So I I hope that helped you today. You know, it, 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 I believe the Lord is pleased when we lift our heads and, and and speak. We, We can graduate from clapping. We, we can get past, we can graduate from clapping. It's uncomfortable, I know, but I, I believe we can do that. Thank you for doing that this morning. The Lord bless you. All right, praise God. By the way, you could turn Acts chapter 25. Um, most of, many of you know Donna DeForest had went to Texas for surgery. She had the surgery Friday, and from what I understand, it was a complete success. Um, I guess we won't know for I guess we won't know for a little while what exactly the outcome is, but they believe they got everything they could as far as the cancer or where it could spread. I don't know all the specifics, but I know she's in good spirits. They're her and Bruce, they're, and they're doing well, and so she's going to be recovering possibly in North Carolina with her kids. They're deciding what they're going to do. Um, so glory to God. That's a, you know. It's not, not, you know, thank you for the doctors, for the surgeons, for the technology, but glory to God for giving them that ability. And Jack is out of the hospital in Florida. He was and should be able soon, hopefully, to resume his treatments for his cancer. Calvin stopped, went to visit him uh, the other day, what, Friday, I think it was, and, you know, just surprised him on his motorcycle, rode all the way to Florida. So, (laughs) yeah. But could you imagine how encouraged they were? Oh, we have the picture. <laughs> yeah, that's a great picture. 
You know, I, I talked to the two of them the other day, and it was just so good to hear their voice again. They've been away for a while, and good to see, the, see their face. But So he's doing well. He's got a, you know, still an uphill climb, but he's doing well. Glory to God. All right. Acts 25. So you may have noticed we're rapidly coming to the end of Acts. Rapidly, because the last couple of weeks we've been biting off whole chapters, which is, you know, it's been almost, you know, over a year and a half in the book of Acts. But it's coming to a quick soon. It just moves fast because Paul's going through the trials, right? He's, he's on his way to Rome. God's getting him to Rome to, to fulfill the, the prediction, right, that, that he would appear in Rome. Or in, um, if you remember back at his conversion, back in Acts chapter 9, verse 19, it says, so when he had... Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, I may, I probably, I have 919, but that's not the one I wanted. It says, but the Lord said to him, talking about Ananias, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before what Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So we've been walking with Paul. We've seen him bear the Lord's name but to the Gentiles and the children of Israel and had much success, a lot of fruit in those ministries. Everywhere he went, there were multitudes of Gentiles and Jewish uh, people getting saved. Um, all the towns throughout Galatia, Macedonia, you know, he'd go into the synagogues. Also, many rejected him as well or rejected Jesus, but many, many did. But now he's going to the kings. Now he's fulfilling the, the prediction get through Ananias that he would be a witness to kings, to those in authority, to the governors that we're looking at. Now, as we go through this, and we've already seen, none of them get saved. Absolutely no fruit that we see from for the rest of the book of Acts, as far as the governors and the kings. They, they're presented with the gospel, they're presented with the witness, but none of them get saved. So why kings? Why is God going through all this, we call it trouble, it's not trouble for God, but it looks like a lot of trouble. He's moving mountains, he's, get, he's doing all of this that we're talking about to get, we talked about divine providence, God is doing all of this to get Paul in front of kings and governors and those in authority, yet there's no, no fruit whatsoever. He's speaking to others. We will see there is fruit. Others in positions of authority as well or, or you know, uh, people who are behind the scenes. And we'll see some of them, get few, few of them get saved. But it sure seems like Paul could have been more effective had God just sent him to the Gentiles. If God just let him go free when he should have been set free and go and, and get back on the missionary journey and, and go to the synagogues and go like he was before, right? It's, but no, he said you're going to go to kings. I believe our text today will give us the answer. But first, let's set the scene for where we are at this point of history. Back, back in verse, chapter 24, verse 27, it says, but after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So you remember last week, he, we went through the trial before Felix, and now, then Felix, now Felix is gone. Festus is now governor of the Roman province of Judea. Felix was recalled to go back to Rome to answer for the way he crushed this rebellion, that the Jews rose up in a rebellion again, and he used really excessive force, I guess, to special violence to, to stop it against the Jews. And that's not really how the Romans wanted to handle uprisings. They, they wanted to keep the peace. They didn't want to have to, because now they have to deal with this. Now they have to deal with Felix slaughtering Jews. And, and what does that do? That just makes them more mad and more rebellious. And, and they don't want to have to deal with this all the time. So they, they would try to, through political means, keep the peace. Felix failed at that. So now Felix is sent back to Rome to answer for why did you, you know, why did you use this kind of force? Couldn't you, you're the politician, you're the one in charge. Couldn't you find another way to do this? So what does Felix do? Well, I got to go answer for myself. Maybe if I leave Paul here, that'll, that'll maybe soften the blow to the, you know, for the Jews a little bit. That'll give him something, you know, to, so maybe he won't get in so much trouble. 
So the Romans wanted to keep peace and it wasn't easy dealing with the Jews. <laughs> They're probably like, why did we go after these people in the first place? They were always, always a problem for the Romans. They were very um, stiff necked people, right? They're very stubborn and they, they were God's chosen people and they knew it and they did not like being under Roman rule, not, not at all. So Felix only made tensions worse. So he knew he was in trouble, so he left Paul to try and gain some favor. So in verse one, it says, Now when Festus had come to the province, after three days he went from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So Portius Festus was appointed over Jerusalem, over Judea, to try to smooth things over. Like that was his job. Just go in there, try to make things right. So what does he do? The first thing he does is goes back to Jerusalem to talk to the high priest, to the rulers there, the Jewish authorities, to try to smooth things over. Listen, we, let's work this out. How can we work this out? What can we do so we don't keep having these uprisings and these rebellions? So there are, things are really starting to boil over at this point. So we're about six years away from the Jews rebelling against Rome and making an attempt to, you know, for their, for their freedom to um, overthrow Rome. And it doesn't go well, as we know. Jesus predicted it, right? It doesn't go well. They are slaughtered, literally millions. We're about six years away, f roughly, from 70 AD when, you know, millions of Jews would, would be slaughtered in this rebellion and the temple would be destroyed, just as Jesus predicted, prophes you know. What were the Jews thinking? What were they thinking? The Roman army was far superior. There's no, they were no match for the Roman army. They had no chance of winning a rebellion. Maybe they thought that trying and dying was better than living under Roman rule. You know, sometimes it's just, you know what, I'm tired of this. Let's just, let's just fight. Let's just fight. We're not going, we can't win, but I'd rather die trying than to win. Oh, maybe you've noticed in our country, things are becoming increasingly divided, increasingly divided. Maybe like we haven't seen since the Civil War. You know, you have, you know, more and more people that, you know, becoming liberal in their th thinking. And, you know, and that seems to be the majority now. And our government follows the majority. This form of government follows the majority because the majority votes for our leaders. And that, but you still have people who are holding to conservative values. And, you know, Christians or not Christians that believe in, you know, stand, you know, have a standard of morality that, that leans towards conservatism. And, and, and it, the, the, the um, tension between the two groups is becoming more and more hostile. And I even, you even hear, you may have heard, you know, talk of, of a, a future civil war, you know, here. Could you imagine that? You know, uh, because, you know, we, we don't want to be told as conservative, we don't want to be told that we don't want laws favoring, you know, that that are against us as conservatives. And but something's got to break, right? Something's got to give there. It's so contentious and it's getting more and more contentious. So, you know, do you know there's a better way than, than civil war? There's a better way than rebellion. There's a better way. There, there was a better way for the Jews. They didn't need to rebel and be slaughtered. Matthew 23, 37 says, O Jerusalem, this is Jesus, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent, sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What is, you know, what is the hen doing protecting the, chil protecting the hens, right? The chicks. God said, I, I wanted to protect you. You did not have to. This is, he's, talk, he's about to talk about the, the, what's going to happen, the destruction of the temple and the slaughtering of, of the Jews. He's looking over them. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. If you only knew you didn't have to rebel that I would have protected you as a hen, mother hen protects her chicks. But you were not willing See, you left your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Talking about the temple and the buildings. Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that it shall not, that shall not be thrown down. What is he saying? If you would have let me protect you, 
if you would have let me protect you. But since you were unwilling, see all this is going to be gone. It's going to be gone. What, he's, still, he's still God, right? They're still his people. But because they were unwilling, because they wanted what they wanted, they wanted a Messiah who would come and rule and reign. But, but, but and because they wanted what they wanted, their whole temple is going to come to ruins. Their whole way of life, millions will die. The answer wasn't rebellion. He's saying the answer was surrender. The answer wasn't rebellion. The answer was surrender. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender to Jesus. Another time in Luke 19, he says, Now as he drew near to Jerusalem, he saw the city and what wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, talking to the Jews, especially in this, your day, it was still the Jews' day, right? It wasn't the time of the church yet. It was still the time of the Jews. They're still under Old Testament. Jesus is there. They're still under Old Testament covenant. The things that make for your what? Peace. If you had only known the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave you one, they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. The Jews wanted and longed for a conquering Messiah. They wanted what they wanted and Jesus wasn't it. Jesus wasn't it. And they paid dearly for their mistake, didn't they? I see so many Christians today that are just up in arms over the government, the culture, the direction of our country. And, and I know it's bad. I, I, I'm with you. I know it's bad. And, and, and I want to do something too. And, and, I, and I, I, I understand. It's like, man, we, we, we can't allow this to happen. This is, this is not right. But Jesus is saying to us, if you only knew the things that make for your peace, if you only knew the things that make for your peace, Jesus is your peace. That's all. Jesus is your peace. He's our peace. Your enemies may build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side, but Jesus is your peace. That's what he's saying. He never promised them freedom from the Jews, did he? What did he promise them? Peace. Peace. A lack of peace is a lack of spiritual maturity. A lack of peace is a lack of spiritual maturity. That may sting somebody today, but it's the truth. The things of peace won't be found in the things of the world. The things of peace that Jesus offers is first peace with God. Remember the angels words to the shepherds that first Christmas here in Luke 2, 14, glory to God in the highest and what? On earth, peace among who? Those whom he is pleased. Is there going to be peace on earth in the world? No. Why would we? the world is doing what we would expect the world to do? They're going to be fighting. They're going to be arguing. They're going to be doing. They're going to be sinning. They're going to be doing what the world does. There'll, there'll never be peace on earth. Peace is for those who are in Christ, who those he's, those he is pleased with. So we're, think about it. We will be, we're living in a world where there will never be peace, yet peace is promised to those that belong to him. We got we to gotta realize this, church. It's important for so many reasons. One, for your peace. <laughs> Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once we were enemies, right? Enemies to God. Now we have peace with God. 
Well, that's good. That's good. It's good to know that we have peace with God, that we've been, we, the things that make for peace are what? Repentance and forgiveness. We have peace with God. We have, we sang, we have victory over sin, right? We have victory over death. We, these things make for our peace. These are things that make for our peace, aren't they? When we have peace with God, we, we have, we have victory over Satan and, and anything he tries to do with us. No matter, no matter what he throws of us at us, we have peace because we have peace. We know that we have peace with God, that he comes to seek, to kill and destroy, but we have peace with God. So we win, Satan. You have nothing over us. Amen. We have nothing to fear. We have peace with God, yeah. with peace with when we have peace with God. What do we get? We get the peace of God. That's something special. That's something supernatural. That's something that we can't attain on our own. The peace of God in John 14, 27, he says, peace, I leave with you. What kind of peace? Peace on earth? Oh, things are going to be great for you now. You're going to have peace. No, in this mixed up world where there is no peace, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Because that would be crazy. Because there is no peace in the world. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Boy, we got a lot of troubled hearts today. We have a lot of fearful Christians when they look at the way our country and our world is headed. Peace, lack of peace is a lack of spiritual maturity. It's a lack of knowing the Prince of Peace. You may have a knowledge of him. You may know him as your Lord and Savior. You may have peace with him, but you don't have his peace within you because something is missing. Something is missing. It's supernatural peace. It's peace. It's his peace, the peace that many believers are lacking because they haven't grown spiritually and are still trusting in things other than Christ for their peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace. That's us. Who? Whose mind is stayed on Fox News, on CNN. Does that, does that help you with your peace? Maybe, maybe you're a, I don't, well, I forgot his name. Because what? Because he trusts in you. Do you want peace? Turn off the news. Turn off the news. Open the book. This is, there's peace in the book yes. and, and trust in it, trust in him. Shouldn't Jesus just have given them what they wanted? I mean, they were his chosen people after all, right? They had no business being slaves to the Romans. You know, so what, what does Jesus do for the Jewish people? Going back to Luke 19, 45, then, after when he went into Jerusalem, after, you know, saying that they're going to tear down the temple, then he went into the what? The temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, <laughs> saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were a very attentive to hear him. So where, what, what does Jesus do? He could have set them free. He could have been our Messiah and the conquering Messiah, right? He could have done that for them. But what does he do to bring about peace? He goes to the temple and chases out the thieves, the money changers, those. He gets the temple, right? He knows that the things that make for peace are found when we clean out the temple, clean out the churches, get the temple right, right. get the temple right. We're so worried about the world. Jesus says, forget, Jesus doesn't even talk about the world. He says, he goes to the temple. He focuses on church. We need to fix our eyes. We need to get the temple right. The church, the body of Christ, these temples. You want peace? It begins in the house of the Lord. Jesus showed us that. This is where it begins. More important than nas their national freedom was getting the house of God in order. Jesus knew that if he had their hearts, they wouldn't be worried about their earthly circumstances. Why were the disciples following Jesus? For their earthly circumstances. He's the Messiah. He's the one who's going to come. The triumphal entry, thousands, multitudes of Jews. 
came together to follow Jesus with two swords to take back the kingdom for Israel. Chanting, excited, Hosanna in the highest. It didn't work, did it? It didn't work. What happened? Jesus got arrested. He got beaten. He got hung on a cross. The things that make for peace were hanging on that cross, yet they couldn't see it. 120 said, okay, I'm going to go wait in, an, I'm gonna go wait in Jerusalem like Jesus said. They were what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Never again, never again do they look for things that make for peace in the world. Never again do we hear, do we see them, listen, never again do we see them in, with, a, with a mindset of rebellion. Never again are they looking for swords. How many swords is it going to take? You know, never again. From that moment on, the things that make for peace were in them, and all they cared about was delivering the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the thing that makes for peace. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's move on. Verse 2. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him that he would summon him to they would that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. So Festus goes to the high priest. How can we smooth things over to bring some peace? The high priest says, "You want to do us a favor? Bring us Paul. Bring, bring us Paul. Bring Paul. Remember, Paul was taken to Caesarea to keep him safe. Bring him back to Jerusalem." And, and by the way, we're going to ambush him on the way, right? Yeah. Two years had passed. Two years had passed that since, since Paul you know, was left in there by, by um, you know, the last trial from the last chapter. Two years. These high priests can hold a grudge, can't they? I mean, really, they hated Paul that much. Like, you want to bring peace? Let's bring Paul back. That's how much they disliked Paul. Remember the 40, assa 40 plus assassins that vowed not to eat or drink until Paul was dead? Well, they must be pretty hungry by now, <laughs> pretty thirsty by now. Now, I'm sure they got out of it somehow. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. So God is here using Paul or Festus to protect Paul again. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. And when he had returned, remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. So, Get a picture of the scene. So you have Felix sitting on the throne, on the judgment seat. You know, where the judges sit, they're elevated. They're up high, looking down, a position of authority, a position of power. So you have Festus sitting in this position of power. You, and you have represent, you know, while the high priest and the elders are all surrounding him. And, and then there's Paul <laughs> by himself in chains, probably in prison clothes. Pretty intimidating, isn't it? You have, you have your judge who you don't know. He didn't, Paul didn't know Festus. He didn't know anything about him. You have all these accusers making all kinds of serious accusations, accusations against you. And, and here's little old Paul. Remember the Bible said he was short and stat, probably short, bald-headed with a big nose. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> describe. And, and, and he's chained up after being in prison for two years. Like, 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 that would be intimidating, wouldn't, wouldn't it? But Paul was never by himself, was he? He was never by himself. He had the promise of God that he would go to Rome to testify. What did Paul have that nobody else in that room had? Peace. Festus is confused. Like, what is going on here? Why, why are we doing this? Somebody tell me why we're accusing this man. Then you have the high priest and the, the elders who are bitter and angry and, and had no peace. You want to bring peace? Well, let's, let's try Paul. Let's get Paul killed. One person in the room that, that had complete and total peace was the Apostle Paul because God made a promise to him that you're going to answer you're going to witness to me in Rome. And what did he say? And I'll be standing with you. The Lord stood by him. The Lord was always standing by Paul. 
So they brought many serious complaints against Paul, but couldn't prove any. And then Paul's defense is pretty simple. One line, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. That was pretty much it, right? And then, but Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done nothing wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things which men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. I appeal to Caesar. So Paul's, Paul knew Felix. He didn't know Festus. I'm not going to Jerusalem with you. <laughs> Paul's desire to go to Jerusalem had died. His dream of going to Jerusalem, that, that died a couple chapters ago, didn't it? He, he would have done anything to go to Jerusalem. Now he's like, I ain't going back to that place. Nothing good is waiting for me in Jerusalem. I've had enough of that. So he appeals to Caesar. All, you know, any Roman citizen facing charges that would warrant the death penalty could appeal to Caesar to have their case tried before Caesar. And it was, that was it. Once you appeal to Caesar, well, you're going to Caesar. And, and it's kind of risky because who's the Caesar at this time? Crazy Nero. So, you know, who would end up, you know, he's the one who would burn Christians as candles, right? He would feed them to lions. So, so Paul's like, bring, I'd rather go to Caesar, take my chances with Caesar. But no, what is God doing? No, this is his all expense paid trip to Rome. Paul knew the direction he was supposed to go now, right? It, it wasn't Jerusalem, it was Rome. I'll go face crazy Nero because I know God said that that's where I need to go. See, when God tells us where to go and we're willing to be surrendered, we'll go faith. He had friends in Jerusalem. He had crazy Nero in Rome. But that when God tells us where to go, we have peace knowing that we're going to get to where God wants us to go. And give, isn't it interesting, if I've done, an, done anything deserving death, then I deserve to die. You know, we, people say that, they're, you know, that the death pe penalty was, was done away with in the, in the New Testament because nobody told Paul that. Where am I? <laughs> so at this point, it wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> anyway, so at this point, an interesting development occurs. A Jewish king comes onto the scene in verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice, wherever you see King Agrippa, you see Bernice, came to Caesarea to greet Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left in prison by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accuser meets the accusers face to face and has the opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed. So, Agrippa ruled over Galilee at this time, and it seems, seems like he just came to congratulate Festus, to, to, to welcome him, to pay his respects to Festus. Now, who was Agrippa, King Agrippa? You, you've heard the name Agrippa. We're familiar with that. Who was this? And by the way, this would be the last Agrippa, you know, the last of the, the Herods. So Agrippa's father was the one who had the apostle James killed. All right, that's dad, had, the one, had Peter arrested, and was, he's the one, if you remember back in chapter 12, was eaten by worms when he took the glory for himself. Yeah. His grandfather was Herod the Great. What did he do? Well, he murdered the children in Bethlehem trying to kill Jesus. What a great guy. Kill all the children a year and under. So, and then um, that was his, yeah, Herod the Great. So Agrippa, he had a better understanding of the Jews, the Jewish law, than Festus did. Festus, 
you know, doesn't know anything. So the rest of this chapter is Festus seeking Agrippa's counsel. To what do, we, what do I do with this guy, Paul? Like, like this, is a Rome, this is a Jewish thing. So in verse 19, but some had questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear from him. So the charges were about religion, not politics. And that, you know, the, this is laying the foundation of the appearance of Paul before King Agrippa. It's not a trial. It's more like entertainment for Agrippa and Bernice. Like, oh yeah, I want to hear this. I want to hear, he just wanted, he wanted to hear a good story. That's all this was. So, so it's not a trial. He's just appeasing. Festus is just appeasing. And, you know, this visitor that's come to pay him respect. Bernice was the sister of Drusilla. Remember Drusilla from last week? Festus's, Felix's wife. She wasn't a good character to herself. The, um, and was also, so Bernice was also the sister of her own husband, Agrippa. All right. Give me an idea of this, this. This is important as we move into the next chapter, 26, next time. But this, yes, they were full brother and sister. And, and yes, they were living together in an incestuous relationship, uh, an incestuous marriage. Yeah. As man and wife. So just to give you a, a picture of of who Paul's going to be addressing. OK. And, and how Paul addresses them. In verse 23, so the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with, with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus's command, Paul was brought in and Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit and to live any longer. But when... I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus. I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord talking about Nero concerning him. Therefore, I have brought you out. I brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. So what does he say? He's like, I, I he wants to go to Caesar but I can't find anything to tell Caesar any charges to bring to Caesar. You can't just send somebody. He was worried about his own skin. I can't just send somebody there without a reason. Maybe you, knowing the Jewish law, the Jewish customs, the Jewish people better, can give me something to write to Caesar, to Nero, to present for this case. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So really, that's just repeating what's already been said, right? But, but Luke is, he's setting the scene for us. They're, they're in an auditorium, okay? They're in an auditorium where there's, there's um, commanders and prominent men of the city. It would have been packed, a packed auditorium because King Agrippa is here and all his entourage is there. So people would have flooded in there. They would have been all dressed up, you know, and, and Bernice and Agrippa come in in all pomp, meaning they're in their all their royal, you know, attire and probably had a whole entourage of people and music. They're making a big show of this. It's a big show in a packed auditorium with people all dressed up and, you know, and then there's little old Paul. <laughs> There's little old Paul, you know, a prisoner in chains. Next time we'll hear Paul's testimony before King Agrippa and Bernice and, and how he handles himself. And, and 26 is a great, a great chapter. It's a great chapter. And we'll get there. We'll look at that uh, next time. But I want to go back real quick to, to verse 19 and 20. But... This is Festus, but I had some questions, but some had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem. So this is Festus. 
highly educated, very intelligent man who rose through the ranks of the Roman army. I mean, he was a nobody who, who, who rose through the ranks, he, who, who used his education and his intellect and, and politics, his, his ability to talk to people and to, to um, persuade people. And, and now he's in a position of authority. Now he's governor over all Judea. And he says, I don't understand any of this. I, it's about their religion, and, and I don't get it. He's talking about a certain Jesus, meaning what? He doesn't know about Jesus. Somebody named Jesus. He doesn't know about Jesus. Think of this is what, 30 some years after Pentecost? You know, after, uh, he doesn't know about Jesus. He doesn't know about the Jews' religion. He you know, and he knows nothing about a, the Jewish Messiah. And what is his exposure to it? What is his exposure to the Jewish Messiah? This is it. Jews fighting amongst themselves, trying to get one of their own killed. The Jews were God's chosen people to make God known throughout the world. Yet every time they interact with the Roman authorities, it's to try to get somebody killed, to try to get somebody arrested, to complain, to complain about the way they're treated, to complain about their taxes, to complain about unfairness and or rebellion or they're rising up and, and trying to rebel and trying. To, this this is these are the people of God chosen to be God's ambassadors in the world. And, and their exposure to the kings and the leaders and the governors. And every time they see them, they're just starting trouble. No wonder the Romans had a hard time accepting the Jewish Jesus. No wonder. This is my opinion because of my experiences, but I believe it's possible that God sent Paul before kings and rulers simply to give them a better witness of Jesus Christ than they've been getting. They will reject Jesus, but they'll reject him having a, received a better witness, a, a true witness of the gospel from a true believer. That's so important, church. God wants everyone to be saved, but he wants them to have a good witness. Like they, he wants us to make a choice, but he wants us to make a choice based on true evidence, on real evidence. Uh, you know, I see this because it's, I believe it's why God called me to Legislative Hall, you know, because I, I've told you before, because they see the worst in Christianity, don't they? You could, I've talked to them. I've talked to those who aren't in authority. I've, I remember talking to the, the Capitol Police, David, he's a Capitol Police officer, and he said, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here because, because he's never seen a, a true believer. I, and I know... I know what he means. I'm sure he has, but maybe didn't notice. I'm not saying, but he's just, I got to know him. And he's like, they need people like you up here. This is a Capitol policeman who just sits and watches everything and makes sure they need people up here to represent the true gospel, the true Christ, because they see a lot of the other. They see a lot of Christians going up there, not representing, wanting what they want, wanting peace, yet they have no peace. Wanting things to go their way and doing so yelling and, and condemning and, and not representing Jesus well. So God doesn't, they will answer for, how, for, they will stand before the Lord and have to give an account. God says, I want you to give an account based on better evidence than you've been seeing. Listen, it's not on them. They're going to be judged for their decision. We will be judged for the representation we gave them. What is the world saying today in the church? What is the world saying? What are they making their decision based on? What do they see in the church, in the body of Christ? Division, don't they? They see division. They see denominations all over the place. They see infighting within denominations. They see, you know, one denomination fighting against another, telling others how bad they are. And, 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 and we're so worried about what it means to be saved and what it takes to be saved. And we're not, there's no concern whatsoever about people actually getting saved. They look at the church and be like, my goodness, it's not very attractive. Why would I want to be a part of that? We will be held accountable as the body of Christ in our generation, how we represented the kingdom of God. So 
2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Those things of the world, those things that make for our peace, those things have passed away, the things of the world. We're a new creation. And behold, all things have become new. Listen, the surrounding, our circumstances haven't become new. We have become new. We're still living in the same mess, but we have become new. Now, all things are of God. Praise the Lord. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us that ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. Oh, my goodness. What a concept. <laughs> and has committed to us. You guys go and impute their sins against them. He committed. Is that what he committed to us? You tell them how bad they are. You tell them how wrong. No, that's not. He didn't do it. He didn't ask us to do it. Now then, we are the ambassadors for Christ as though we're God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Nothing about telling them how bad, the, imputing their sins to them. No, our message is be reconciled to God for me. He, he who, made, who knew no sin to be sin, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? Because we were, we were sinners and, 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 and God's, Love, God's representation of the Father led us to want to know Him, led us to reconciliation. We're to do the same thing, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What's an ambassador? We're called to be ambassadors. Did I read all of that? In the secular world, an ambassador is a representation of one country while residing in another, right? If I go to Afghanistan as an ambassador of the United States, I'm representing the United States. Anything, you know, I have full authority for, as an ambassador of the United States to speak on behalf to, of the United States in, a, in another country. That's what an ambassador does. They speak and act on behalf of their homeland in the host country. You ever been embarrassed for a country when you see some of our ambassadors acting on behalf? Half of America and other countries, yeah, I won't mention any names, but it could be pretty, it's like, oh my goodness. What must they be thinking of America? What must they be thinking of America? They're, are they thinking, okay, well, this person is a buffoon. They, 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 but they're not, but, but they're saying, they, they elected this person, they chose this person to represent America. It's a reflection on who? All of us, all of us, all of America. As an ambassador for Christ, you represent Christ's heavenly kingdom. You represent heaven. People should look at the body of Christ and say, yeah, I want to go to heaven. I want to be like them. They represent something that I could be a, want to be a part of. Yet, the way we're representing today has the exact opposite effect on many, many people. It takes a move of God to get people to want to come to church. God really has to move on somebody's heart. And then how hard is it for him to find, how hard is it to find a church that, that is actually representing God well? Have you been looking for, ever looked for a church? You know, it's hard, isn't it? I talk to people all the time. Man, I, I'm, I'm looking for a church, and, and I've been to a dozen churches. And, but when Joyce and I got saved, we went to a dozen churches looking for a place to get married, and every single one of them only reinforced my idea that there is no God. It took until, thankfully, thank the Lord, he brought me to a church where I saw God in the people. How many? I don't know, not a dozen, but it was a lot. It was a lot. And every single one, what did we see? You heard the story. The one, we go out in the parking lot the, after the service, the guy comes out. Oh, he's not our normal pastor. Don't listen to him. <laughs> he, he didn't know what he was talking about. Like, yeah, I get it. There is no God. Just reinforced my notion that there is no God, that I want no parts of that kind of nonsense. Thankfully, he brought me and, and you to a place of, of, of seeing past all of that and, and seeing who Jesus is. As an ambassador of Christ, you represent Christ's heavenly kingdom. You represent heaven. 1 Thessalonians 2. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our 
God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness. You know, it makes a difference. We, we don't want to present the gospel in uncleanness. Nor was it in deceit. Oh my goodness. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. We might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul was very careful how he lived and acted. Why? Because he knew he was accountable to God. As an ambassador for Christ. Listen, as we go through this world, we represent another kingdom. And it's our responsibility to reflect the message of the king. Not what we want, not what we want to see, what he wants. We have to be very careful how we conduct ourselves, don't we? How we represent our king. It's no small thing, church, to go to the restaurant after you come out of church in your church clothes and belittle the waitress or whatever because your food was a little cold or a little late coming out. You've heard me say it before, the, the, worst, the worst shift for, in a restaurant is Sunday afternoons. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to, to, be, to get that, that shift because, because the church people are the worst people to wait on. And it's, I'm just not saying they all are, but, but that's just the reputation that we have. Yeah, they want to, I'm sure that makes them want to come to church. I'm grateful for this church. This is a church. This is a church that people can come to, that God can bring people to, to hear the gospel. Not because of me, because I'm talking because of you, because I'm just the, the mouthpiece. But they, people come and they're looking at you. They're wanting to see Christ in you. They, may, they want to see what the kingdom, they might not even know it, but they, want to, they need to see what the kingdom looks like. I'm just a person. You represent, we represent the kingdom together. They need to come to a place that looks like the kingdom of God. And we do do a pretty good job doing that. I think we can get better than clapping and, and we can really praise the Lord. And because and, I believe that's what the kingdom looks like, right? We're not going to stand around heaven clapping. What are we going to be doing? We're going to be singing. We're going to be praising God. So, so we need to graduate from clap. All right. Um, um, that's not in my notes. All right, so. <laughs> We're going to get there. <laughs> We're going to get there. Thank you for helping me today. <laughs> no, we, what do we do? I, 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 I want people to, to see this. I do. I want people to, to experience what we have here. So, you know, I'm grateful that that we can only hold so many people in this building, that we're so limited in this building, that we can't really do anything in this building. It's forced us to think outside the box and to get outside the box and into our community, amen? And that's why we do the events that we do. You know, we're gonna have Biker Pit Stop coming up. And, and I think there's probably close to 30, 30 of us that have signed up and there'll be others to come. What is that? That's a good representation of what we have here because I know that when we take this, put it out there in the parking lot, if we can get the bikers to come in, well, guess what they experience? The kingdom of God. And they love it. They linger, they hang out for hours because they're experiencing something that they've never experienced before. They're experiencing something that they cannot experience at the bars and the pub, whatever in Ocean City and the parties. They're experiencing something, something different, real, something meaningful, something full of joy because they're experiencing us as the body of Christ. And you have to be there to experience. I mean, it's this out there. <laughs> And I trust that, you know, I, because I, we can do this because I trust you. Because I, don't, I know you're not going to be out there fighting over who's making the hot dogs and the hamburgers and who's, who, no, this is my job and I want to do this. Or we don't, We're not going to be fighting one another. We're just going to be loving people and having a good time. Isn't that what it is? If you've been, a, it's like a three day picnic. We just have a good time and we allow people to come in and experience that. And the impact of that has been tremendous. The thing we hear over and over again, man, I, I haven't been to church in a long time or I've never been to church. But when I get home, I'm going to find a church. And what do I do? I was like, oh, I hope, Lord, please bring them to a good church. <laughs> because I, the odds are, the odds are they're not going to find a good church. 
I hate to say that. I, I don't want to bash churches, but it's just the truth. It's just the truth. It's why we go to the fire hall. It's why we do the Halloween thing. I don't like Halloween any more than anybody else, but it gives us a chance to take what we have here, bring it out into the public and let them experience us. I've explained that over and over again. If you still have a problem with it, you need to get over your self-righteousness and, and come out and be a part of that. It's why we do the things that we do. Because God believes in you. I believe in you. The world needs to see and be a part of this, amen? And they're not going to come through the doors because they've been turned off. They've been turned off. Aren't you glad that Jesus came and represented the Father well? Aren't you glad that he came in, in un, in, in, in not in uncleanness, but in cleanness? That, that he didn't follow his own will, that he didn't fall into the temptations that Satan threw against him, that he didn't come as a political ruler, that he didn't come and, and just care enough about the Jewish people, the chosen people, and, and take back. Aren't you glad that Jesus came and followed, did what the Father wanted him to do and represented him well? Don't you think we should do likewise? We should represent Jesus well. The world deserves it. Jesus deserves it. He did, church. He came. Maybe you don't know this Jesus that I'm talking about. Maybe you've been turned off by the things of the church. That's not our God. We apologize if we've been a poor, if the body of Christ has been a poor representation, a poor ambassador of Christ. But the truth is, Jesus came. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world to become one of us, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life he came to create to fix the problem that man created the sin problem and by living a perfect life an exact perfect representation of the godhead of the father in heaven that the, and and by submitting himself surrendering himself on the cross shedding his blood that by his blood we can be forgiven of all of our sins past, present, and unfortunately future sins. It's all covered. We just have to believe it. We have to acknowledge him as Lord, as the one who is able to do that, who is the creator of heavens and the earth, the creator of us, the one who is able to forgive us, that, that his blood is sufficient to cover our sins no matter what we've done, to confess it with our mouth, believe in our heart that, that Jesus, that he raised him from the dead, accepting his sacrifice. It, that's all we have to do. And then we begin this journey, this faith walk of getting to know him more and more. If you've never done that, if you haven't done that, well, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning, now's your opportunity to do that. We would ask that you would be bold in front of men and women and raise your hand. And because and, Jesus was bold enough to hang naked on a cross, we can be bold enough to raise our hand and say, yes, Pastor Jim, I want to say a prayer receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior. We will say it with you because we'll be happy that you've done that so you don't have to say it by yourself but you do have to raise your hand and say yes if that's you this morning would you raise your hand and say yes to jesus okay i don't see any hands so church what's left for us how do we do this how do we do this how do we obtain this peace from the lord what was that that slide i asked you to put up um so your we sang it today, didn't we? You sang it with passion. You sang it with fervor. You I could hear you singing, didn't they? They sang it pretty good, didn't they? You sang it from your heart. Did you mean it? Your spirit lives within me. So what? So I walk in peace. Where does this peace come from? From the Holy Spirit. If you lack peace, what are you lacking? Maturity, Maturity in the spirit. But guess what? Guess what? God is willing to pour out his spirit on all of his children. Overflowing, overflowing. You don't have to lack anything the spirit offers. The peace of God is a fruit of the spirit. He just wants to fill you with his peace. We just have to surrender. Amen. Well, Lord, I pray that's our heart today. That when the world sees the peace in the church, that they will want peace from Jesus Christ themselves. Lord, may your spirit so overflow us that, uh, that we will no longer be centered and worried and 
and, and anxious about the things taking place around us, but like you, <laughs> like your apostles, like the, like, like the early church, Lord, they, they were, that were willing to die for their faith because they had the peace of God which surpasses all understanding within them. So fill us now with your spirit as we surrender our will and our ways to you, as we surrender our cares and anxieties, as we, as we place them at your feet, Lord. Fill us, replace those fears, replace those worries, those anxieties with your spirit, Lord, that we would allow you to have complete rule and reign in our lives, Lord. And, and that in that we can witness, we can witness the gospel to others, Lord. We can love people like you've loved them. Lord, help us, help us to be the best representation of Christ that we can be. Help us to grow in the things of God that we would look more and more like Jesus every day that people would take notice, Lord, and, and through that, Lord, the world will always be a mess until you return, until you reign as king on the earth again. But Lord, for now, we can do our part, one soul at a time, reaching one soul at a time for the gospel, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can see, we can see Dagsboro transformed. We can see bikers transformed in a, in a month, Lord, as they come onto our property. Lord, use us for your glory and for your, and your honor to, for the building up of your kingdom. Lord, that's all that matters in the end. That's really, that's all that matters. Just may that weigh heavy on our hearts today as we go in peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.